good morning. Everybody properly caffeinated? Getting there? <laughs> it might take the rest of the morning. The caffeine doesn't work. Orange juice, stretches, exercise in place. Uh, I'm Ray Saltini. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, being here at, at DrupalCon. How many first timers? Oh, wow, awesome. awesome. Okay. okay. How many, how many folks, uh, two plus Drupal cons under their belt? All right, brilliant, very good, very good. Well, you're in for a treat uh, this morning, and I think you're in for a treat with the business track in general. So if, if you're here because you are uh, involved with your, your own uh, Drupal undertakings and, and helping other people leverage the benefit uh, of, of Drupal, I think uh, you're going to want to uh, enjoy and pop in and out of the business uh, track the, during the course of the week. Uh, and you're starting off the right way with a presentation uh, on security issues. So, uh, so welcome, thank you. A little bit about uh, FFW and, and who we are, who we used to be, and what we uh, hope to continue to do. So uh, we used to be known uh, uh, as Blink Reaction and Pro People and three or four other brands internationally. And last year we came together uh, and became, wow, the largest Drupal service agency of its kind on the planet. And we, while we consider that that may be a temporary condition because it's uh, a very uh, variable uh, business and many of you in the audience may, uh, may aspire uh, but what we really hope uh, that you aspire to is, is what we try to be not just the biggest but hopefully one of the best uh, in, in doing that and one of the ways that we uh, like to think that we are one of the best is by providing as, as much support as we possibly can to the Drupal community so we're back again uh, this year as a diamond sponsor uh, of, of DrupalCon, very proud of it. We were diamond sponsors uh, last year when we launched our uh, new brand identity. Uh, we're about uh, 400 uh, people strong uh, across the globe, and we really did it because we wanted to be able to serve uh, our, our clients and the Drupal community from a global perspective because many of our clients are large enterprise organizations that have that work in those different markets. Uh, and so Rather than, than leave those clients uh, w without the ability to, to get qualified Drupal services in those markets with folks they had worked with, we felt that we had to grow with them and grow with Drupal. And I think that's probably the reason why a lot of you all uh, are here as well. So um, one of the very special things that we do and I have the privilege of, of doing is uh, managing the um, Drupal 8 uh, uh, excuse me, the FFW Center of Excellence. And so uh, if you care to visit our website, uh, ffwagency.com slash event, and we have a whole bunch of free Drupal training online and in different markets. Uh, and that's really brings me to the next, ba the, the ne the next uh, 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 event that, that you're gonna be spending your time here for the next hour. You've got three individuals here who've been in the Drupal community for a very long time, none of whom I, I know particularly well personally, <laughs> but for those first timers, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna find that you get to know people pretty quickly because a Drupal event after Drupal event, when you see folks that you recognize, just stop them, start a conversation, talk to them about some of their passions, and in particular, about some of their experience. And so all three of these folks here, no surprise, have terrific experience in the, the area that you're here for. But you're, you're here to have the security conversation, uh, as, I, as I understand it. And you're in good, good hands, and it's our, our pleasure to help bring it uh, to you. So stop by our booth, say hi, say hi to me, say hi to our other team members, but make sure you engage these folks and get the most uh, out of it. So, thanks very much. Thank awesome, you, guys. Thanks, Ray. All right. How about that introduction? Thanks, Ray. That's that's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, here's the thing. We have a pretty long presentation here. Uh, so, but uh, we're gonna. At the end of every section, there's going to be key takeaways. So that's when your pencils can come out. 
Um, it's also great to see some familiar faces here. We really appreciate you guys showing up. Um, and if you guys have questions, there's a wireless mic uh, up there that we'll, we'll do. I think we'll save questions. And there's the also end. a really good, um, we just found this on Google Slides, so <laughs> bear with us with technology here. But if you go to the link that's going to be at the top of the slides up there, um, you'll be able to ask questions to us, and it'll hit us in the panel here. Um, this is great if you have a question that you don't really feel comfortable standing up to the mic and questioning us with, um, or if you see something on a slide and you want to ping us with a quick question without interrupting us, um, that's fine. But also feel free, um, this is very much like a conversation that we want to have. Um, and so if you guys do have a question and it just can't wait and you can't shoot it on here, um, feel free to raise a hand or something. But Try to use this because it's pretty fun. Yeah, and by the way, uh, the session will be live in a couple hours online, so um, you can tweet it out to your friends. Say you just were sitting in the best first session of DrupalCon that there ever was. <laughs> Especially all you people that are here for the this is your first DrupalCon, it will automatically be the best session you've ever been to. That's true. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's do a, just a brief introduction. We all we bring a few different perspectives. So Drew. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm Drew Gordon. I'm the director of community and agency outreach at Pantheon. Uh, I used to run, I was once upon a time, I was a developer, started my own agency, grew a team, became a CEO. While I was doing that, we created a product. Uh, and so I have a, a variety of uh, perspectives on a lot of topics. Um, and now at Pantheon, I get to work with a lot of different agencies and see a lot of different practices across a lot of uh, verticals and spectrums. And I'm uh, Luke Probasco with Townsend Security. We are a data security company. Uh, multi-platform encryption and key management solutions for the enterprise. We've been focusing on Drupal lately. Uh, and uh, I do a lot of business development within the Drupal community. And uh, we work a lot with Drupal shops uh, who need to deploy encryption and key management to meet compliance and uh, manage risk of data breaches. And I'm Chris Deitzel, um, founder of Cellardor Media and as well Locker, a product that we just recently launched a couple months ago. Um, the seller door side of things we've been doing for uh, many years now. We do apps and, and uh, website development. And as, as we're going through that, we found the need for more security. And so we built our own uh, key management as a service platform called Locker. So. All right, so uh, we're going to start off with, you know, like the let's wake up, quick game. Uh, so just to like show of hands, um, how many people, at, you know, like in your own personal web use, how many of you re reuse email addresses when you sign up for accounts? Like, Should and be how many of you are, <laughs> okay, right. All right, and uh, usernames, likewise, usernames. Same username. Same username, yeah. Uh, anyone ever share a password occasionally? Maybe just on the services you don't care about, you know, nobody. Not to your friends, but like, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, real names, that, like go to, the, you create accounts, you've got your real names, date of birth. Uh, posting things publicly on LinkedIn, Facebook, doing any of that. Twitter. Right. <laughs> a lot, yeah, a lot of these, so um, uh, one of the things that a lot of us think about when we think about security is that it's about credit cards. And that's actually not really true. Uh, credit cards are, yes, an asset, but in like the, 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 the dark market that's out there, the value of a credit card, the stolen credit card, is it, it's going to range, it's going to depend on time and place and other things like that, but say, order of magnitude, 5 to $30, something like that, stolen credit card. And one of the reasons for that is because the credit card companies are really good about shutting things down, right? They see a fraudulent purchase. How, how many people have had that happen? I mean, I certainly have, right. They're really quite good about it. Um, the, on the other hand, things that you can do with personally identifiable information and take and sort of fake a person's actual information and use it to, say, create a medical record, uh, that's orders of magnitude much more valuable to someone who wants to use your information maliciously. Open up bank accounts, uh, do all kinds of things like that. That's hundreds of dollars per account. So uh, piecing together information from Facebook, LinkedIn, other accounts and such is, is in fact what hackers would like to do. If you leave a credit card lying around, they'll take it. But that's not the only thing they're looking for. And it's really important to realize that a lot of the information that we work with on a regular basis is actually stuff that's potentially uh, like uh, a resource for hackers and something that we need to be careful about securing. All right, so uh, an interesting stat here from the Identity Theft Resource Center. As of May 3rd, so, you know, what, a week ago, uh, so far this year, there have been 348 breaches with 11,361,547 
records exposed. I mean, that's that's pretty mind-boggling <laughs> if you think about it. it what, we're like, and we're only five months into the year. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's crazy. That's this year. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we as we talked about, um, you know, just be careful what kind of information is online. I actually recently had, and just as an example, had a friend who, uh, who whose Facebook got hacked. They had a lot of public information. So a hacker actually recreated this person's Facebook account, their name, all of their pictures, like galleries, everything, and then started to like fish information from like the friend list. Um, so you just gotta be very careful about that. Um, yep. And there's a very famous hack that happened uh, a few years back with one of the editors for Wired. Um, and the, the hacker was able to go to Amazon and go to customer service and say, hey, I'm having some issues getting into my account. Can you help me out? And they go, oh, is this the account that ends in uh, with credit card 1234? And they go, oh, yeah, that's it. Um, what's your email address? Oh, I forgot. Hang up. Then they called up Apple and said, hey, I need access to my iCloud account. And they go, can you give us the last four digits of your credit card? 1234. And they were able to get in, reset the iCloud, erase years and years of this guy's uh, family pictures, his, um, all of his accounts, all of his devices, um, and it was all just so that they can get access to a three-letter Twitter account. Um, and so it's a good example that seemingly um, information that you don't think is very important can be used and can be leveraged in many different situations. And so as we're building websites, and, and some of us are building some very large websites, uh, we need to we need to talk to each other and and know what are we using as identifiers, what are we using, um, and what are we storing, and what are we giving people access to? Because if if I have something that I think is is worthless and it's all of a sudden your identifier, um, we have an ability to to cross over and have a hack. And just take a quick look at the slide. Uh, look at look at all the top reaches there, um, and think about how many of those actually involve credit cards. Not not really a lot. So just to kind of make a, a point there. Yeah, and if you're um, and and if that concerns you, and you sort of wonder like, what what do I have out there? Uh, it's okay to check right now. Have I been um, It is a uh, is a site. Throw in an email address. It's actually run by a security researcher. I'm not going to do any more than you know, sort of mention that. Uh, you can you just check that and know. Um, so we we all like this quote. Um, Upon uh, his capture in 1934, Willie Sutton, uh, was a bank robber, was asked by the FBI agents, why do you rob banks? Um, his answer is, because that's where the money is. Um, and so um, you have to think about, people are coming to your sites, hackers are coming to your sites, because that's where the information is. Um, that's where the money is for them. Um, and so you know, we're going to be talking about scale, if you're small or large, you have information that is worth something to someone. So you need to think about that. Just got a question in the Google Slides that says, what's the URL for that website? I'm assuming that it's for the, um, the big uh, infographic. It's posted at the bottom of it. Unfortunately, the, the um, projector's kind of cutting off the bottom. One thing I did forget to mention is that if you go to uh, this session on um, the events page, we do have the slides already posted up there, so you can follow along locally if you want to do that as well. Yeah, sorry about that, yeah. So um, breaches are not a matter of if, but when. Um, Robert Mueller, the former uh, director of the FBI, was quoted as saying, uh, there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. Um, and it's even merging into one category, those that have been hacked and those that will be again. And one that we like to add to that is those that don't even know they've been hacked. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes people can get in and, and start siphoning off information and you just don't even know it. Um, and so if, if you can get anything out of this session, yes, we all know credit cards are important. Hopefully none of you are storing credit cards. I'll get to some stories about that later. But um, what we want to emphasize here is that security on your site is more than just a credit card. Um, there is so much more information out there. And, and if you're hacked, you can get access or you're going to be giving access to um, folks' information. All right, so we're going to talk about a, a, a few common security myths, um, and and the uh, the first one we're talking about is that you're too small to be a target. So we're looking at that big uh, the infographic from Information is Beautiful. Um, let me go forward to the next one. Uh, that had all of you know like all you know 60 million records. How many of us uh, like build websites with 60 million records, right? All right, well, okay, all right, several <laughs> of us, okay, but most of us don't, right? And most maybe most of the websites that we build don't have that many records. Um, 
And so I think it's kind of natural for people to think like, I'm just too small to be a target. Like, why would they care about me? Uh, that is absolutely incorrect. Um, in fact, uh, you have, by virtue of having a website, you have a number of assets. One, you have an internet connected computer. That computer can itself be used in further attacks, right? It could be something in a chain or it could be used like uh, later on as a botnet. You also have visitors, right? People go to your website. They might be using outdated or insecure browsers. What if they want to install something on all of those people's, you know, those vulnerable browsers? Um, you have uh, proximity to other systems, like the Mossack uh, Fonseca hack plausibly could have been caused by uh, vulnerabilities in either in both WordPress and Drupal, as well as a, up, a couple of other things. Like it wasn't Drupal that had the all of the information, but it was Drupal as a first in a chain to another server and get to the next server, and all of a sudden, all of this information is exposed. Um, and if you do have personally identifiable information, you do have credit card information, you do have other things, that's a bonus. But just those other things in and of themselves are reason for someone to target you and your website. Yeah, and, and one thing I just want to add too, uh, to the quote, I'm too small to be a target. Uh, a lot of hackers actually know this, uh, and that's why they're not, uh, well, actually why they're focusing on the small uh, and medium-sized businesses. They know that the enterprises are harder to crack. They have huge security teams and have you know, uh, all the barriers in place. So. And one thing to note is that uh, a lot of times people just go around knocking on doors, is what I like to call it, and they're just going around just tapping, 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 and all of a sudden one of them opens up. So just put on the common deadbolts. If, if nothing else from this conversation you guys get is here are some deadbolts, here are some uh, ways that you can protect your site, because if you look at um, a hack like Target, um, the Target hack came from a small vendor um, that, was, that was hacked. Um, they had a pipeline directly into the financial system of Target, don't ask me why, um, and that allowed a foot in the door that they then creeped through their system, got to their credit card terminals and stole everyone's credit cards. So um, your seemingly small, I think it was an air conditioning vendor um, in, in New Jersey, your seemingly small website can all of a sudden become an attack vector for a large um, multinational corporation. Yeah. All right. So we're going to just roll into, uh, you know, we're talking about some myths here, and we can just do this one quick. Private businesses are not regulated. We also often talk uh, to businesses that fall under compliance regulations, and that's, that's just false. Um, oftentimes, actually, organizations fall under multiple compliance re regulations. Uh, some of the common ones that uh, you might want to be asking your clients if they fall under, or even just what industries uh, they're within. Uh, for example, PCI DSS, which is anyone that takes credit cards. Uh, you have HIPAA for people that are in healthcare, uh, FFIEC for people in banking, uh, FISMA for government agencies, and FERPA for educational institutions. And a lot of times, uh, you know, if you're working with people within the, these industries, they might not necessarily think to say, hey, I fall under these regulations, but as uh, Drupal shops and Drupal developers, uh, it's also, I think, a little bit on, uh, on your shoulders to make sure that you're setting up your clients for success and meeting compliance. The next one that we often hear, um, and this is what I hear a lot from our work in encryption, is that encryption is complicated, it's too difficult. It's really not. Um, and part of what we've um, been trying to do, uh, at least with the suite of encryption modules around Drupal, is to make it dead simple for someone to use and use properly. Um, and so, yes, encryption itself is incredibly difficult. Um, it's a complex mathematical equation that um, basically if you took all the energy output from the sun in 32 years, uh, you would still only count to 192 bits and we're at 256 bits. So you can understand that mathematically it's impossible to brute force a, ha a, a, a an encryption key, uh, but someone's going to find that key. And so, um, if you start looking at um, standards and and what is published out there as the recommended steps, uh, you'll find that there are some very clear steps to say this is um, approved and recommended encryption methods. These are approved and recommended key management methods. And if you follow those, encryption can um, can be very easy to implement, uh, especially within the Drupal system. And so, um, a lot of the times, people and and you know, as a developer, I I fall prey to this as well. Is that it's too complicated. Is there another way that I can do it? And it, at times, the answer should be no. Like you should should be encrypting that data. And and just briefly, uh, another uh, myth that we hear: uh, security kills performance. So it is true that uh, tools like encryption have a performance cost. 
uh, but there are many factors that affect the total system performance, and in fact, applications such as databases and all the major operating systems uh, have been tuned for decades to provide optimal performance by minimizing the amount of time spent uh, going to disk. So um, as long as encryption is implemented correctly, the overhead is very, very minimal. And as a note from the, uh, the encryption modules that we're building in Drupal, um, we've addressed this with um, you know, memory-based key caching for the entire bootstrap of Drupal, all this different stuff. So uh, if your developers come to you and say, hey, I don't want to do encryption, it's going to kill our site performance, um, you can kind of point them to this and say, no, it really won't. And the, uh, the last thing that uh, we often hear is that clients aren't paying me for security. And, uh, no, that's really wrong, actually. <laughs> they're, they're, they're paying you for results. Like, if you asked your clients, do you expect your website to be secure, I bet they will all say yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and if you're not really sure about that, like, what if the people look below you in the stack, what if the, if, you know, how would you feel like if your hosts or the platform you're running on sort of felt the same way, like, ah, you know, they're just doing Drupal, it doesn't really need to be secure. Like, that would be very alarming to you. This is the same assumption that your clients bring to you. Right? They are paying you for results. And they don't, you know, like, they might not know the word CSS, or, well, it's not really a word. They might not know the acronym CSS, but they are paying you for it because that's one of the things that you're delivering, right? Security should be one of those things. And uh, uh, if, uh, and, it, and, you know, we'll be talking about this actually quite a bit more, but it's also a place to differentiate yourself. If the client is not educated about security, if they're not asking for it in the RFP, maybe you can stand out from the crowd of people that are also replying to that and add a section. And maybe you can actually even add some price and add some stuff and then they're gonna be, wow, well, you know, we thought we had this much of a project but we're gonna go with this, you know, a larger project for this better agency because, wow, they just taught us a lot about security and we know they're gonna do it right. Who are all the rest of these people? Yeah. And are they even thinking about security? Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> All right, and so big takeaways here. So uh, hackers are, in fact, targeting small and mid-sized organizations. Compliance does, covers all industries. You've got to build uh, security into the sites. Clients should not have to ask for it, and it's really not that hard. And so uh, one thing we wanted to point out here is that at the end of each of these sections that we're going to do, we're going to have a takeaway slide, so that way you guys don't have to feverishly write notes throughout it. These are kind of the boil-down bullet points, and so we'll be doing these for each section, um, and then you can grab the, the slides later online. All right, so we're gonna get into some security fundamentals. Uh, we'll just kick this off. We'll start with the, the CIA triad. Uh, not something we made up, and also doesn't have to do with the actual CIA. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's a great way to educate yourself and think about all aspects of security. Um, you should be focusing on them all, not just one. Uh, so what does CIA stand for? Uh, confidentiality integrity and availability. Uh, think about confidentiality as uh, the data that is supposed to be protected. Uh, confidentiality is roughly uh, equivalent to privacy. Um, encryption, which we've talked a little bit about already, is a common method for ensuring confidentiality. Uh, user uh, IDs and passwords constitute a standard procedure. You should also be thinking about two-factor authentication. It's becoming more of a norm. And you should also just really err on the side of more confidentiality. Um, integrity, uh, so this means like only the people that should have access to that data have access. Uh, and availability, um, make sure the site's always online. Uh, make sure that you have high availability uh, in case something goes down. Uh, there should be redundant resources serving up the infrastructure and uh, something that may actually influence uh, availability just for like a real life example, uh, maybe like a DDoS attack. Which is a distributed denial of service. It basically means that somebody's gonna be flooding your site and your server so hard that that server crashes. And so um, this happened, uh, I, I believe it was last year with some of the uh, online gaming platforms, uh, PlayStation and Xbox, both went, underwent uh, DDoS attacks and were offline for, for a couple of days apiece. Um, because of that, um, yeah, they're not hacking data, they're not stealing credit cards, but they just took down a, a major service and that cost Microsoft and that cost Sony real dollars in, um, in not only having the service down, but then also um, cu customer you know, trust and, and everything else. So brand sentiment. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of different ways that, uh, that somebody can hack your site or, or attack it 
um, that you need to be looking out for, not just they're going to grab a credit card data. Yeah. And another piece of this is, is important to understand is that security is not something that's on or off. It's not, it's not a binary, uh, it's not a yes, no question. It, it is more and less. And there are ways you can be more secure and ways you can be less secure. And uh, hopefully by attending this and, you know, like there's, there are other security sessions. I think uh, we have, there's Watch the Hackers Hack, I think a little bit later on uh, in, I think, 345 today. Are mm -hmm. you doing that one? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's going to be put on by some of the members of the security team. You can see maybe some of the techniques, like some of the forces of evil um, and, and what they're up to. But um, through that, learn how to make your site more secure and then educate yourself as to w ways to make it even more secure. Um, and that's a lot of the things. So it's not, it's not just on and off, it's more or less. I lost my spot. Where are we? No. Um, okay, all right. And so, uh, personally, sorry, I, I wish you could see the screen. <laughs> that would be really nice to know the slide we're on. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, personally identifi identifiable information, or PII, uh, is, is, is part of the jargon. So it's just something like if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this term, you should you know, be aware of that. Um, Again, set yourself apart when you're talking to your clients about PII. PII is, is, uh, is any piece of information that can be combined with something else to come up with someone's identity. So, for example, phone numbers, uh, email addresses, date of birth, uh, those kinds of things uh, can be combined with another piece to sort of like triangulate who a person is. Um, and uh, sometimes, depending on, like uh, uh, Luke mentioned, a number of compliance models. We'll talk about some of those as we get into some like common case studies about you know what small businesses need and and, and uh, ed education organizations and such. But um, sometimes those like PCI or other um, frameworks can say like these are the pieces of PI. So it can depend on the uh, the compliance regulations that you need to meet. And another uh, interesting. Um kind of game that we played in a, a previous talk that we did in Barcelona. Um, we had everyone stand up and then we asked three um, seemingly you know, innocuous questions from what would be assumed from someone's Facebook. Uh, we did it last year in, in uh, LA as well. How many people live east of the Mississippi? How many people uh, have a birthday in March? And how many people own a dog? Three things that you would find on anyone's Facebook page. And we were able to take a room of about 300 people and, and whittle it down to three. Um, and so if you, again, if you think that the information that you're collecting is not um, sensitive, it is. Um, if you're collecting information on one of your users, it is sensitive information because it can be combined with others. And just one other thing that I'd like to point out, Drew was talking about the different kinds of information that websites collect, you know, phone numbers, first name, last name. Uh, if you think about just even the context that a lot of companies are collecting this information, it doesn't have to be like a, like a, healthcare account, you know, and it could just be a marketing website that's collecting information for a white paper, but you now have all this PII for like a big list of people. So um, we got a couple of great questions that are that are coming in here. Um, one of them is uh, if we have stats around market perception sentiments towards open source security. Um, we can definitely find some. We'll tweet some out later. Uh, one thing to note, and one thing is, is you're talking with folks, you're going to hear people say, I don't want to use Drupal. It's insecure. It's open source. Um, that's the opposite of, of what, it, um, what it is really. Because an open source project by nature has more eyeballs on it. Yes, the code is published. Um, but by the code being published and more eyes on it, you actually end up with a more secure platform. Um, if I'm going to write something and I'm the only one who knows it, um, I can easily skip over something, or a team of five developers can easily skip over something. Um, but you have, you know, wonderful people like the Drupal security team that are constantly monitoring, um, and every module that's published on Drupal.org is backed by the uh, security team, and there are security fixes, and there's there's protocols for all this. So, open source, not secure, not true. Um, and the other one was uh, about a DDoS attack. The way to protect yourself from DDoS attacks is put something in front of your website. Don't just have your website be plugged directly into the web. Um, and so I, a good example of this is, is Pantheon, um, Acquia, and uh, a lot of the hosting providers all have layers and firewalls in front that will detect that and then shut off traffic. Um, Cloudflare is another great one. Um, they are a DNS service that will monitor traffic and as um, they detect a DDoS attack elsewhere in the world or um, on a different site, they'll actually prevent that IP from hitting your site as well. Um, and so if you, if you join um, either hosting providers that are a, a larger hosting provider and not hosting it yourself, or you go through um, someone like Cloudflare, you can kind of benefit from 
the internet at large. As one DDoS attack happens, you'll be protected from it as well. And that, that actually brings up our, our next slide quite well, which is yeah. defense in depth. So um, David Strauss, um, one of the uh, Pantheon uh, founders, has this great term of don't build Death Star security. Um, we've all seen, um, hopefully, this uh, wonderful movie. Uh, and the idea here is that um, defense is not a perimeter barrier. We don't just build the Great Wall and hope nobody jumps over it, right? Um, we don't build a Death Star and leave an exhaust port that's going to blow the whole thing up. Um, we want to make sure that everything we do in security is layers upon layers upon layers because when it comes to uh, defense in depth, the more layers that you have in place, the, the more time it takes to jump. Um, and, in, and in hacking and in counter hacking or uh, addressing somebody who's trying to attack your site, um, it's all about time. Uh, how fast can you uh, realize that somebody's hacking your site and shut them off? And then how long does it take for them to get through? So if the first couple steps are really easy, but then they have a couple of larger walls to jump over, it's gonna slow them down. And hopefully you have the, the pieces in place to be able to, to detect some of those, uh, those earlier breaches to prevent the deeper breaches from occurring. And so um, you can't just say, well, I have password policy installed on my Drupal site, so all my passwords are secure. I don't have to worry about anything wrong. Um, there are so many different vectors than just one. And so when we talk about security and we talk about um, defense, it really is everything on the site. But being here in the business track, we also have to think about it's everywhere in the company, right? It's not just the developers. The developers aren't your only you know, wall of security in your, in your company. You need to start thinking about the marketing team, the sales team, the executive team. Everyone that's um, in the room in the company has a role to play in security. So um, takeaways here, uh, there's no magic bullet. Um, sorry, we wish we could give you one. Um, but um, if you have a defense in depth approach and you have these layers that are building up, um, you're going you're gonna to be better off. Uh, and then another thing is uh, we always like to say if you don't have to collect it or store it, don't. Um, it's one good way of, of getting around having your site be the hub of all information that um, is going to be hacked is if you don't keep that information. A lot of uh, third-party vendors now are doing a really good job. Uh, for instance, Stripe um, and some of the other payment providers are now allowing um, JavaScript libraries that you can um, send credit cards to them without ever having to go through your servers. Well, you've just reduced your PCI footprint considerably by doing that. Um, if you're using a, a, a credit card processing that goes through your website, um, your PCI burden becomes much larger. And so um, rely on other folks um, if you can. And so this is the heart of what we want to get to is that security is actually really good for your business um, and, and not just good for your business from, hey, our website's up, uh, but from a dollars and cents point of view. So um, first off, um, stand out in your proposals, um, win more RFPs. If you're um, going out and, and bidding on an RFP or you're, you're going out and putting out proposals, um, you're going to be competing against a bunch of other people. If you can stand out in the crowd and have a clear um, outline of what security you're going to be implementing on that project and how you're going to be taking the steps, maybe the security steps within your own company, um, you're going to stand out from the crowd. And as Drew was mentioning earlier, um, a lot of larger RFPs will require security because they've been through a, a longer process internally and they know uh, and they have security teams that are going to say, we require this, this, and this. Um, so if you start implementing good security within your business and within your development, uh, you'll actually be able to go out and start becoming competitive at some of these larger RFPs. If not, um, a great way uh, to kind of um, add some extra juice to the, the proposal and add some extra scope to what you're doing is um, always add security in. If somebody hasn't put it in, be like, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to make you more secure. Um, I can almost guarantee you, and as a business owner myself, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, you're going to spend a little bit extra money, but you're going to be more secure, nobody's going to say no. It just if, if you can make the clear point that this tool will make you more secure and because of that you'll be a better business it's very hard for a business owner to say no to that um, the next thing that we have to look at here is that you can actually be liable for a breach um, and so this is kind of a cya thing as a as a dev shop um, we had some internal banter about this Technically, the breach um, from a security standards point of view from HIPAA and PCI and all those will fall on your client um, because they're, they're solely responsible for their uh, implementation of it. But um, myself included and a lot of dev shops that we've talked to, 
um, you have to structure your contracts with your clients to make sure that uh, a you, that liability is is uh, clearly defined. And if it's not, and all of a sudden they're hit with a ten million dollar um, fine because of this, they could turn around and sue you for $10 million because you're the one who implemented that. And if your contracts aren't correct, uh, you could be liable for that. And, and raise of hands, how many people here could just walk out with $10 million out of their business uh, and be in business tomorrow? Exactly. So um, this is something that we need to um, reduce the risk uh, by implementing the proper security that you have, um, even if they don't ask for it again. And um, even if you um, have to take on the cost yourself, we've had to do that on a couple of clients. It's like, look, I know you're not going to pay for this, but I have to do this. Otherwise, I just am opening myself up to too much liability just, here. Out of, out of curiosity here, uh, show of hands, how, how many people uh, evaluate their, their contracts and what it actually says about security? Is this, is this a big issue for you guys? All right, cool. Great, great. Um, and so then also um, minimize your exposure to, um, to sensitive data. Um, it, don't store passwords. Don't have clients send you passwords. Um, it just is bad. Um, I have clients that will send me like root passwords to your server, and it's like, great, you just added 10 hours to scope because I have to go rebuild everything now. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about here is that as a business and to make your business profitable from security um, is to minimize your exposure. If you are going to be held liable, minimize what you're going to be held liable for. Um, and, in, and in certain situations, um, it, this means telling your client no. Um, and that's something that you as a developer and you as a business can do. It's, it's, it's actually possible. Um, you can tell your client, no, I'm not going to do that. And they'll actually respect you for it. Um, and you can bring up that dialogue of saying, I'm not going to do it. And here's why I'm not going to do it. Um, I've had examples of this with clients where um, they've asked me to build a certain database or a certain form. Um, and I'm like, that's just not secure. I won't do that. If you want to find someone else that will, great. If you want me to build another solution, I will. Um, and so feel, feel confident in saying no. We can stand up to a client and say no, we don't want to collect that information. Um, and then also, you know, this is a, a burgeoning um, industry. Uh, it's, it's been around for a long time and it's becoming more and more prevalent as almost every business now has a website. Almost every business is now uh, exposed to an attack. So start building a name for yourself. Um, security is growing. Um, now that we have IoT, you have the internet in your refrigerator and your shoes and everywhere else. Um, security is everywhere now. It's not just in your website. And if you can become one of the leaders in security, you're going to start growing your business uh, in ways that you, you uh, may not be right now. How many, how many of you are interested in raising your hourly rates? Yeah, all right. Yeah, if all of a sudden you become the security professional, um, you can do that. And you can, you can kind of start you know, raising your rates and becoming the security professional that comes in and helps out. Um, and it builds trust. And, and as you guys uh, well know, as uh, business owners and, and, um, and managers yourself, is that if a client trusts you, they're going to come back to you for more and more work. Um, you've turned that three-month project into a three-year project. Um, and then they're going to go talk to all of their friends or people that come to them in, in their network. And so um, as you start building that trust of, man, these guys really saved my bacon. Uh, we almost got attacked, but we didn't. Um, they're going to tell folks about that, and your name's going to start getting out there. And, and one other thing I just, I just kind of thought about this right now uh, is, is, you know, I see a lot of people out here that maybe are like, like well, God, I'm not a security expert. How am I supposed to make a security-focused agency? There's good thing is there's resources like you know us that you can then work with and then we can help bolster your agency and have that bring that expertise to your your agency and you don't necessarily have to be a security expert yourself or your company mm -hmm. just bring in those resources yeah and there's a ton of stuff I mean you, and you don't need to go to third parties there's a ton of stuff you like just spend time learning it make it a priority absolutely. Tons and tons and tons of resources. So a couple of questions more. that have come in. Um, do any of the tools that you mentioned report breach attempts within Drupal itself? Are they platform specific? Um, the beauty of having platforms, and, and I can speak this from not being from Pantheon, uh, the beauty of having platforms such as Pantheon and Aqua and the rest is that this is happening constantly. Um, if you're on them, your site is being DDoSed right now. You just don't know it, and it's being protected because somebody else is worrying about it for you. Um, there are, um, there's a, a hack module um, for Drupal that you can install and it'll kind of run through some of the basic, you know, known hacks. Um, a, a good example of this was after Drupal Geddon. 
Um, there was a, a great tool that you could just run down all your sites and say, were any of these breached from this? And these are the known ways that people were getting into it and, and provide those. And we can provide you guys with a list of those later as well. Um, another question is, while you speak about all the personal data being important to protect, such as do you have a dog, what do you say about sites with rich public user profiles where this data is in exposed intentionally? Um, personally, I don't like to expose a lot of that data. I choose. Um, you have a choice as a user to, to put out into the world what you want. Um, some people will put more, some people will put less. Um, and then as that site uh, um, builder, you have to think, it, is, is the benefit of this being in a public profile worth the risk of it being exposed? Um, and that's something you have to weigh on a on a time by time basis. I'm not going to critique anyone's one site. Uh, would you say by default to make your site HTTPS? Yes, 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 yes. And there's um, also SEO benefits. Yeah. So <laughs> Google's now up um, upranking people that are using um, SSL, which is awesome. Um, SSL is now free with Let's Encrypt, um, so you don't have to pay these four or five hundred dollars a year for a security certificate. You can actually go get them for free now. Um, if you don't want to do that, Cloudflare, um, we brought them up earlier as a, as a uh, DNS uh, uh, protection tool. They also now allow for um, secure relaying. So basically, they sit between your user and your site and provide that SSL connection. So um, at this point, the cost of, of securing your site with HTTPS is so uh, minimal and sometimes free that there's no excuse not to. Um, and then. The last one is, are there any tools available for securing sending credentials to clients and partners? I like 1Password. Um, there's Password Manager tools, um, uh, LastPass. All of those have the ability to invite people into your organization. You can share passwords. It's all encrypted, and you're, you're protected in how you um, send passwords. That's how I like to do it. Um, and, and every, every uh, employee that's onboarded at our company instantly gets uh, password or one password installed on their computer and it's like you will start using this immediately um, and and I always tell people the best passwords you have are the ones you don't know so um, yeah so those are some of the questions there and I, so we've got um, also just to like note to ourselves here yep. <clears throat> we've got 15 minutes left we've yeah so we got, <laughs> we're gonna run we've got these. a few things um, towards the end of this deck though we have some uh, very specific Drupal modules that we uh, recommend some stuff about securing Drupal very specifically um, so if you're looking ahead you're looking at the slides online again you go to the, the note on the we'll conference just, site yeah and we'll just jump uh, a couple of slides here. Sure. Um, this quote here is, uh, is really uh, yeah. in particular. It says, everyone has the right to the protection of personal data. Um, and this is coming from an EU mandate. Um, Europe is, is um, leaps and bounds ahead of us right now in terms of uh, how they're protecting their users and, and the public in general. Um, and I think you're gonna start seeing this trickle down into the US as well. And this is something we need to be watching and looking for is that, um, data privacy is now not just a good thing to have, it's a right. Um, and that's opening you up to um, you know, a whole range of, of things from lawsuits and everything else if you infringe on that right. And this, this slide and the, and the prior one, we're not gonna go too in depth, but the, the gist of what we wanted to convey here is uh, compliance requirements and regulations are evolving. It's not just like your PCIs anymore. Uh, people, are, new organizations, there's continually guidance that's being updated. So um, takeaways here, win more projects, win larger projects. Um, security can be um, uh, more tools in your tool belt. Uh, protect your business uh, by protecting your clients um, and uh, grow your business in the process. All right, so uh, in the process, so you go through a process in, in, either in a proposal stage or in discovery. Um, there are a number of questions that you really can, you know, should focus in and ask your clients about. Um, so, Thing, like what information is going to be collected, who's going to have logins, um, anything being sold, any donations, like, and sort of like have those parts of the conversation. For those of you doing sales, those of you doing project scoping, make sure that these kinds of questions are in there. And uh, if you hear any of these words along the way, e-commerce, uh, donations, integration, APIs, uh, registered users, paywall, or any just forms in general, like these are places to like sort of like perk up, oh, interesting. I'm going to note this, like, and again, like, if you're sort of on this journey of learning security, and uh, you know, you don't have, you're not, you don't feel confident yet in being a security expert, you know, bring this back to the person at the organization who is, and sort of like, ah, oh, they mentioned this, you know, make sure you sort of track these as like key places to focus, um, and uh, you know, we've really already talked about this, so 
Uh, oh no, these are the dig out. All right, yeah. Anyways, yeah. So yeah, that's why we got talked about it. All right. So PI. Yeah. <laughs> so use discovery to uncover security concerns and dig in deeper on those on those trigger words. And so in your business, um, and as you start growing your dev team and just within the marketing and sales that you do, um, it's important to create a culture of security, not just uh, a line item of security. And so every person on the team is responsible for their part to be secure, whether it's a developer, whether it's a marketing, whether it's your C-suite, um, it doesn't matter who uh, and where, they need to be thinking about security. Um, I know I've worked at companies in the past where it's like, um, all of a sudden the CEO is like, hey, I've, here's my email password. Can you log in and help me with this issue? And it's like, no, I can't. And you just screwed over my day because I have to reset your passwords and all this. Um, so every person, no matter if they're um, touching the code or not, is responsible for their portion of it. Um, so sales and marketing, make sure you use services and tools that have been vetted for security, payment gateways, cloud storage. Um, use things like Box. Um, Box is a really um, cool um, encryption now that allows you to even bring your own key, so you're the one encrypting it with your own key, um, which makes it extra secure for those uh, of you that are working in large enterprises. Um, payment gateways, all of those are stuff that um, you should not be touching any of that, and so leave it to the people who, uh, who can. Um, the website responsibility more and more is falling under marketing, so have your marketing team know about website security in a general sense and what to look for. Um, and when in doubt, don't post it. Um, this includes internal memos, external uh, blog posts, all that type of stuff. Think about what you're posting out and is it going to be uh, creating a, um, a vector for attack. Um, and then uh, one of the things that, and, and this is what we kind of deal with in, in doing a lot of security, is that stay away from the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and, and doubt. Um, it really kind of boils this, it, it's primal to us all, and so we all kind of react to it, and it's not in a good way. Um, and what I like to say is, rather than using FUD, you use it uh, security as an empowerment tool. Like, we are going to make you more secure, and by doing that, you're going to be better, rather than coming in and being like, ah, if you don't do this, you're gonna be hacked, and you'll lose millions of dollars, and all that good stuff. FUD just doesn't feel good um, for, uh, for a lot of folks. So, um, for the dev team, um, allow time for them to uh, spend researching and learning about it. Um, don't just push your dev so hard um, that they just can't think about security. Um, do regular code audits, so have other folks in the company look over the code that's being created. Um, more eyes equal more, uh, more security. This is why open source is good. Um, an award and recognize failures caught by the team. I, a quick antidote that I really like is that Google has a division um, that does all their experimental stuff, and they actually award failure. Um, they will give out awards, they will give out bonuses based on your project failing. Um, and I think that's a really interesting take to, to, uh, on business is that if something fails, you are protecting profits and, and margins in the future. Um, and so if somebody on your team finds a bug in someone else's code, don't just be like, oh, quick, it, you know, Fix it quick and let's just not talk about that again. Bring it up, celebrate it, be like, hey, good job, you fixed that, you saved us, now let's go, let's go do the next one. And I think that's a, a, an important culture to, to build. Um, and also involve the development team in the proposal process. I know this sounds very um, you know, basic, but at times it's like, I will get a proposal um, as a developer sometimes and I'll get a proposal or, hey, we just landed this project, here you go, and it's like, I had no idea what is going on here, and I, if I did, I would have changed five different things. Um, so just because the development team is working on this portion of, of, the, uh, of the project, give them access to more of it so that they can um, uh, tell you about different security concerns there. So practical tips, um, we've run through some of these already. Use password managers, 2FA, uh, two-factor authentication, so uh, text you a, a login password that type of stuff. Um, keep your internal, external Wi-Fi separate uh, if you are gonna provide a guest access, so that way your guests don't just save your password and all of a sudden they're on your, your network forever. Um, and then do regular security audits, discussions, memos. Create that culture of conversation around security and don't just have it be this taboo word that you just don't wanna discuss, right? So takeaways, everyone's responsible. Communicate uh, is key and encourage it. Uh, learn from your failures. It's okay to fail. We will all have a site that will be hacked, um, and it's more of how do you react to it um, and how do you use that to make yourself and your, your team and your company better. Uh, and then also, your being more secure makes me more secure, so focus on security and we'll all be, we'll all be good. Okay, uh, just going to cruise through these um, pretty quickly here. As a security company, uh, 
we see uh, a lot of people coming to us to, for two, two primary reasons. Um, one, to meet compliance requirements, and the other to uh, manage risk. Uh, we're gonna look at kind of three case studies here, small business, uh, enterprise, and uh, higher ed. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing about these is uh, they all have similar requirements, um, and we'll just go th through here pretty quickly. Uh, they all usually integrate uh, other services, like whether it's a PayPal or a MailChimp, um, there's API keys associated with that. And so a security best practice, uh, as well as uh, oftentimes encryption keys, a security best practice is to always keep those keys separate from like the, your website or your encrypted data. That way if a hacker breaks into your site, they don't have the keys to the kingdom. Um, talked with uh, 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 some people here at DrupalCon last year, they were just doing crazy stuff and like, have, you could tell when they had the aha moment. Uh, they're like, yeah, we, I work for this big company, we, uh, you know, media company, and people submit forms online uh, because they want to be on a reality show. Oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> that needs to be protected. Um, so, lot, lots of, I'll we'll just kind of cru cruise through here. You got uh, encryption keys, API keys, uh, higher ed, those are just, it's a total ecosystem. Uh, How many folks here are from the higher ed? Uh, we tend to have quite yeah, a bit of folks. Yeah. Great. So you got you have uh, probably wellness centers, so people fall under HIPAA. You have bookstores, so you fall under PCI. You're a higher ed, so you fall under FERPA. Um, you, you gotta gotta think about all these compliance regs. So let's just go through. Uh, so to takeaways here, I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, you know they all have similar concerns. Uh, sites large and small. Um, there's a lot of modules and services that can help, and uh, security is a good business investment. Uh, a couple of questions that have come up here. Um, how do you handle the current United States government push to weaken the RSA? Uh, it's horrible. Um, anyone that is in the security industry will tell you that this is Pandora's box that we do not want to open. Um, if you want to go on Twitter rant later with me or if you want to in person over a couple of beers, I will talk your ear off on this topic. Um, the site for free SSL is Let's Encrypt and um, Cloudflare. Uh, would you say that SSO uh, is better in terms of security? Yes, because you're having one source of truth rather than having passwords in multiple places. So uh, using Google, using Facebook, and some of these other ones to allow your, your um, uh, users to log into your site is a good thing. Um, and then we'll, and go through, uh, we'll go through some of these for, um, for the how to test for modules, or the hacked modules and those. Um, and there's actually some, uh, uh, yeah, we'll get into some other ones here real quick. And SAML, if you're in higher ed, probably use yeah, some SAML. Sort of SAML. Yep. Um, SSO meaning single sign-on. So one of the things, like if the, in those case studies, uh, the, it was like, you know, what should you focus on? The, you know, this, starting with the small business, they've got, um, they need the hosting secure, they need Drupal secure, they need some API keys secure, and then if you're bigger, you need that plus more, plus more, plus more. One of the things that's uh, a piece in that is constantly is hosting. Uh, here we are at DrupalCon, hooray Drupal, we like Drupal, it's a good thing. Uh, if you're looking for a host and you want to pr find a good hosting provider, you should start at the Drupal.org page for hosting because uh, these are organizations that care enough to put money back into Drupal and support it in that way. Um, in preparing for this talk, uh, however, like sort of realize that that page starts off with uh, a class of hosts called shared hosting and you know, you're probably proclaiming and like sort of blinking numbers like 295. Uh, that's not going to be really great for security, unfortunately. So. Uh, from that perspective, I, you'd be very, very careful of, of shared security. And I'm just going to un, unscripted uh, ask the Drupal security team member here in the audience, uh, without impugning specific organizations, do you recommend secure, uh, uh, shared hosting? No. That's, that is a head shake of no. Um, so one of, my, one of my favorite quotes that, that Drew said mm -hmm. in the past is, if your site is worth more than 295 pay more than 295 for hosting. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, so um, again, like, it's complex. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, we're short on time. I would ha be happy to sort of discuss this at, at much greater length. Uh, cloud architecture, though, is, is sort of like the new, uh, there, there's a better way to do hosting. And uh, Pantheon is certainly an example of this in the Drupal space. There are others, Heroku, other kinds of, uh, you know, a different sort of philosophy in the way that you deploy computers and keep them secure. And uh, again, happy to discuss that at, at greater length. But Let's go ahead. So, um, 
if you're looking for a secure host, start on Drupal.org, but don't do the shared hosting kind. Um, uh, and add some, add some security questions to an evaluation of a host. Uh, for example, Drupal Geddon, big, big, big security problem uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, if they don't, if the host doesn't have a story about like, oh yeah, we were able to, you know, like do this and here we go and we were protected and we saw the attacks start rolling in later. If they don't have a story like that, you should like, whoa, red flag that. Likewise, things like Hartley, there are lots of kinds of vulnerabilities happening constantly and being exposed in the platform. Um, uh, you know, on the, uh, just like, again, to architecture, because of the way that Pantheon works, what's, what happens is that we're able to change that once and then flow it across the entire uh, infrastructure, it's powering hundreds of thousands of websites, billions of page views, and we, you know, a couple engineers, the way it should work, computers it, boom, all good. Uh, yeah. So um, we're going to kind of combine these uh, um, these next couple of pieces together. Um, again, the slides are going to be posted. Um, this is one of the hard topics about security is you just start getting really passionate about it and you can talk forever on it. Um, so come find us later and we'll talk to you more about it. But um, there are some great um, references here for how to secure Drupal. These are some great tips. Um, some modules, uh, like we, we mentioned earlier, and there had been some questions about. Um, and so uh, take a look at those, um, everything from encryption to uh, key management, login security. Um, because we're here at, at DrupalCon and, and uh, Drupal 8 was just released, uh, Drupal 8 is um, the most secure version of Drupal to date. Um, it is uh, an incredible uh, advancement here. From a business side, um, Drupal 6 is end of life, um, which means that um, it's a great opportunity for you as businesses to start um, going out and doing these migrations from D6 to D8. And in that, you can start mentioning, hey, we're going to push you to a more secure platform. Um, as many of you that uh, have, have looked at the code on D6 sites, a lot of it is really nasty. Um, and it's just because we had to do what we had to do. Um, and so upgrading it, and, and as you upgrade, um, fix those pieces. Don't just do a straight port from D6 to D8. Take a step back and, and look at what you're doing and say, can we do this better? Can we do it more secure? Um, yeah, so core isn't an island anymore. Again, the whole open source uh, is more secure theory here. But more eyes on the project, more people around it. No PHP in core, which is awesome, uh, because now if somebody hacks your site and gets access to user one, they can't just enable PHP and start running for, um, for the hills with it. Um, you know, your theme layer is actually very insecure um, in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, and so um, you'll hear a lot about Twig, and that's uh, a big security advancement there. Um, and so then also you got opportunities, uh, like I said earlier, to upsell. Um, and then the whole API um, piece that uh, Dries was talking about today, you're now opening Drupal up to more places. You're going to have more um, vulnerabilities when you start introducing this uh, API layer. It's things to start thinking about. How do you access and, and manage control to the data? Uh, so takeaways, um, Drupal 8 is leaner, newer, faster, better. Um, upgrade now. And, uh, and you'll expand um, your projects and your scope uh, by doing so. All right. So in conclusion, so uh, just to, like, you and your clients are all targets. Um, there is a business value to security. There's a lot there. Uh, you start building security into your processes and culture and proposals. Can we go to the next one? Um, and, uh, and into your billing. Add the line items for it. Um, Use a secure hosting provider and uh, improve Drupal security with uh, some configuration modules. And again, those specific ones we listed are on the slides. The, the module pages have, have a great uh, overview of them. So thank you. We went long. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, one more question uh, that popped up in here. Somebody's building a, a distro for D8, and they want to encrypt a lot of it, but they don't want to own their keys. Come talk to us. Um, Luke and I can tell you about keys all day long. Yeah. Um, and if there's any questions, um, I mean, we're technically over. Um, so if you want to ask a real quick question at the mic, you can, or you can just come up yeah. and talk to us. And, yeah, uh, come on up and talk. We're friendly. And yeah. thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, if you go to the.